uh, uh, preparation of the National Elephant Action Plan meeting that is actually revealing that there is further movement of elephants south of Shimba Hills uh, National Park. Um, <clears throat> The 13 elephants that are going to be translocated are actually, it's actually a composition of uh, three calves, um, and uh, majority of uh, the others are, are actually what we call uh, medium elephants. And then there are also the mothers. There are six of them. There are actually six females. Uh, and most of the males are within the ages of two to probably about five months. And so it's a complete herd. Uh, and the origin of this herd is uh, a mixture. Some of them uh, left from Tanzania, others from Zimbabwe, and others from South Africa. So that's actually the composition of uh, the herd that is actually going to be moved from Kenya. The report, I'm just going to do a synopsy just to give us an idea, um, identifies the positive impacts of the translocation. Uh, one of it is that uh, it's going to create employment opportunities. Uh, it is also going to promote tourism, uh, both local and uh, global. Kenya has been, since COVID hit uh, the globe, uh, Kenya has actually seen an, increment, an, an increase of local uh, Kenyans actually visiting the conservation areas. And then also, it's also going to enhance community empowerment in various aspects. And then uh, the other one is also, it's also going to enhance wildlife conservation uh, together also with animal welfare issues. And then of course, the issue of managing population viability. So uh, the area is suitable for elephants, but we don't have elephants. And then the negative impacts of the projects, of course, is disease transfer. Uh, that one also needs to be taken care of. And then the human wildlife conflicts. And then there are issues of poaching and illegal hunting. Uh, one of the reasons why the elephants declined in the Shimba Hills, I think it's, it's attributed to poaching and illegal hunting from the reports that I've read. And then also vegetation loss due to fencing. Uh, and then also for the establishment of the enclosure once the animals arrive in Kenya, some certain vegetation is going to be cut. And then there's also the element of transportation. We are all aware that the elephants are going to come by air to Mombasa. And the issue of now, once they get to Mombasa airport is to whether they want to go through the ferry uh, that's leaving the Mombasa Highland to the mainland, or whether they are going to take the long trip, uh, which is uh, slightly longer. And then of course, issues also to do with water for the elephants. Climate change is also one of the issues that has been singled out. Uh, and then the other one is also the occupational health and safety, uh, and then issues to do with security, uh, particularly for those who will be working in the sanctuary, uh, and then also the impact on the ex existing populations. Uh, remember, these elephants are coming from, uh, uh, from a wild uh, park, uh, and then they're also coming to interact also with wild elephants that are within the Maluganje, the and then the potential inbreeding issue. So these are just some, but uh, the synopsis that I wanted to share with you that is in the report. Uh, and uh, we are here to hear your views. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, you have gone through the report and you have read uh, so that then now we want to welcome questions and answers. If there are any questions that need clarification, we can actually clarify them now before we go on to the next session of now collecting views in terms of uh, whether there are any gaps in the current study report. So I now open the meeting for questions and answers. Thank you. If you want to speak, uh, kindly just raise your, your hand to we'll be able to see and then we'll give you the opportunity to speak. So the floor is open. I have a question. Yes, proceed. 
You can also so, mention your name before you ask the question. All right, my name is Felix, Friends of Nairobi National Park. Uh, I can remember recently during the translocation of rhinos which took place in Kenya, and they were taken to some areas, if I can remember well, it's um, not the, a different place from where the elephants are being taken, or there no big difference in terms of the climatic conditions. And it was um, confirmed that the rhinos, most of the rhinos dying because of the issue of uh, water quality and the salty water conditions. Have they been able to consider such a factor, the water quality that uh, the elephants will be taking, noting uh, the difference of the quality that they are taking from the United States or where they're coming from, the zoo, and the situation of water to where they are going. Well, thank you. Maybe we can take about uh, three questions and then we can uh, address them. And I know here we also have uh, experts with us on the call. Uh, I will also be requesting uh, some of them to respond to some questions. So is there any other question? As we wait for other questions, uh, Felix, in response to your answer, when you look at the environmental study report that has been circulated, they have actually uh, do, done an analysis of the climatic conditions of the elephants, the elephants in uh, wet uh, national park. And they have actually considered that. And uh, all those issues are actually uh, mentioned in the environmental management plan section. So you should be able to look at it there. Um, and that's why water again becomes a critical issue. Uh, and we are also aware that the area also has the rivers and uh, uh, flowing through the entire ecosystem. So uh, kindly just interrogate with the report uh, for more details on that. But there is I, a component. I have a question. That. Yes, Juliet. I have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. Uh, when you transport these animals, have we already prepared the community to be aware of the dangers and uh, so that they can also get precaution? Or is it just a matter of uh, taking uh, the animals there without uh, the community being involved or being educated on how to take the precaution as the animals come? Thank you. OK. Uh Thank you very much, Juliet, for that question. I think we'll have to uh, we will have to look at that when we are actually looking at the proposals within community involvement. Yeah, thank you. I think we'll deal with that as we look at the math that we look at the issues included in the study report. But that's a good question. Steve. Yes. Yeah, I guess there are several people with hands up, and now I'm barging in front of Rabia. But just because it's a related question, I spoke with um, Rob Kahartley from uh, the Shelter Trust about this, this whole move. And uh, he mentioned that the Shelter Trust was responsible for, or had raised funds for, I have to, I have to be, I'm not sure of my words here, but that, that funds were available for a fence to completely surround Shimba and Wanaganji, the whole the whole area. And so I just wanted to ask what you or anyone else knows about that and you know when that would be started. Um, he also spoke about a corridor to leaving a corridor open from there to to Savo for for, for the elephants. Um, so that's just a, a kind of a comment or or question if anyone can add anything more to that. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thank you, Joyce, for mentioning the hands that are up, up and I can see uh, your hand was up and you finished. And then the next one is Keith and Rabia. Maybe we hear from uh, Keith and Rabia and then we can respond to those ones. I think Rabia's hand was up before mine, so I would, I would okay. let her go first. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Keith, and thank you, Steve. Um, firstly, my apologies because I actually haven't seen the um, this EIA. 
um, not on the CAK WhatsApp group. So I might have um, missed the sharing of that. However, and this might be captured in there. My question was more relating to the monitoring post release. Are there any plans to, for example, maybe collar one of the herd to follow their movements and um, kind of monitor their interaction with other herds and also with the community? That was just my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Kit, back to you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> actually, Joyce um, uh, mentioned the point that I was going to, to ask. And so, <clears throat> as just to <clears throat> sorry, reiterate the, uh, the question about fencing, it, it, the, the report suggests that the entire perimeter of the Shimba Hills and I guess the surrounding uh, protected areas are, are going to be fully fenced. Um, and so just the question of is, is confirmation of that. <clears throat> also, it's, it's a process that will take some time. I know the elephants are, are to be enclosed in a, in a settlement area for a period of time that, but it is a question of how long it's anticipated that it would take to fence the entire <clears throat> area. And then Joyce mentioned this possibility of a corridor. Uh, this, uh, for me, the fencing of protected areas is a serious problem when elephants, where elephants are concerned, because whenever you get fenced uh, areas with elephants, then there is within a very short period of time damage to the vegetation that's considered unacceptable. Uh, and that creates a whole host of new problems. Uh, at the same time, it's recognized that there are communities surrounding the, the, the area and they have to be kept safe and separated. So this, this issue of fencing is quite important and critical to the whole thing. But equally, the suggestion that there might be a corridor uh, so that elephants' numbers can um, balance themselves naturally by moving in and out. And it's mentioned that at the moment, Chimba Hills has perhaps too few elephants uh, and that they, so, so movement of elephants in and out <clears throat> in the longer term is, is an issue. So uh, just clarification on this question of the intention of the project to fence and to have a corridor would be, would be very welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, allow me just to, to, to share with you the part, part of the report where they, um, interesting, I can't, I, can't, I can't even share anything right now to figure out. Oh, Sheila, can you make me a co-host so that I'm able to share my screen? Done. You have? Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, first of all, the report uh, has followed a few elephants and uh, what are projected there is the movement uh, of the elephants and the Northern is the Maluganje Sanctuary. And these are not many elephants, probably just a few that have been collated. You can see the movement of those elephants is up to the northern part of the Shimba Hills. And uh, right there in the middle, there is a road actually cutting across uh, from Kuala Town. Uh, when you look at uh, this particular section where the airstrip, there is also a road that is starting from here and connecting to Mombasa, Boi Road, somewhere around Samburu area. So the area we are talking about, the corridor, is this section here. And within this corridor is actually where a second uh, community, which is the Golene community, have actually come together. Actually, it's two communities that are coming together uh, and this is where the release of uh, elephants is actually going to take place. And uh, surrounding is actually going to be, to be communities. And this is where I totally agree with uh, Dr. Joyce and uh, Dr. Keith, uh, that fencing would, would, uh, would not be about fencing the entire uh, facility, uh, but creating some movement between Shimba Hills 
and Mwaluganje for purposes of uh, connectivity. And I think that is what the report identifies. So the fencing is to minimize conflict with people uh, and then also to limit access so that then the movement of elephants will also happen. But I also did mention that new information and new data that is coming is also showing that elephants are then moving also from Shiba Hills, that is the southern part, all the way to Bukalunga. And I'm happy that Dr. Mulama is here, who have been doing a lot of work also in terms of uh, uh, the Soconot project. They will also shed some light. And these elephants are also moving from Lungalunga all the way to uh, Savo National Park. So the, uh, so, so, you know, Savo ecosystem. So the question then is, how do we ensure that uh, this movement of elephants is not actually uh, blocked, which is actually a big concern at the moment. Uh, the other question that Rabia, you talked about post-release is uh, like Keith has rightfully mentioned, the report actually uh, identifies, uh, the report actually says that the elephants are currently undergoing training because they have never been to the wild and they are actually been trained in the UK. And when they arrive in Kenya, they will actually be held in an enclosure for some time as they are also trained then to adapt to the new environment. And we do not know exactly how long this process will take. Uh, but when I read the report, there is also an indication that they're actually going to call us some of them to see how far uh, they are going to move. So I think all those issues are things that we need to look at the management plan and see how they are actually addressed. Uh, and also, uh, the, because it's going to be the first, um, I don't purport to have read the entire report, but uh, uh, there is also going to be active research monitoring in terms of adaptation and in terms of movement, uh, because nobody has experience of uh, moving elephants of this magnitude into, uh, into a wild uh, habitat. And so those are the responses that I have for now. And then uh, Juliet addressed the issue about community preparation. Uh, yes, when you read the report, the, there has been an engagement with the communities because the two communities have actually formed what is called Golini and Mwaluganje Wildlife Conservancy. And uh, through that, they have also uh, had their bit of share, uh, particularly uh, submitted their comments on the proposed translocation. Uh, but again, uh, I may not be in a position to say that actually the entire community has actually been consulted. But one of the things that we will do is we'll reach out to Kenya Wildlife Conservancy Association to hear how much uh, the communities on the ground actually are, are involved and what their thoughts are as far as the process is concerned. So those are the comments that were arising uh, from the question and answer. If there are any, uh, maybe we'll take again another set of questions. Joyce, I can see your hand is up, or that's an old hand. Um, it's a new hand, but uh, maybe an old comment. Just uh, you mentioned about the corridor between Maliganji and Shimba, which I guess would be something along the lines of the, uh, you know, from um, uh, uh, the Kimana Sanctuary to Amboseli, where it crosses the road. Um, but uh, in in thinking what I was talking about was a or what Rob had mentioned to me was a corridor to Sabo and I guess that then fits in with what they've been finding on the with the satellite tracking but that the, the plan would be to leave it open in some way so that the elephants could also move out of this system to the greater Sabo ecosystem. Excellent thank you thank you I know Dr Mulama is here Dr Mulama do you have any comment on that? Is he here or he has dropped? I had seen him here, but I know there is actually that new information coming in that there is actually a corridor connecting Shimba Hills and, uh, and the Savo West. And particularly these elephants that are coming, I don't think they will be able to move that far, uh, but we will see what, 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 what they are adapting adaption speed and uh, movement will look like once they get here. Good, so I, I would like to take us now back to the report where we will look at the 
issues that are uh, mentioned in the report, particularly uh, on the section that looks at the environmental management plan action. Uh, but maybe just to also, before we get onto the report, is the issue of the identification, the impact identification and analysis. Uh, is there any gaps that you think uh, uh, needs to be filled or there's a particular issue that has not been uh, identified in the report? I'm making the assumption that all of us have actually gone through it. All right, so if I project the report, uh, for the sake of some of us who've not had an opportunity to go through it. Uh, this is a section that uh, deals with the issue of identification of uh, and the analysis. So this one literally talks about the potential benefits uh, for the government. Right, that's a high, has a high potential for tourism within to attract tourists into that area. Uh, we know very well, we know at the moment there's very low uh, movement of tourists to Baluganje Sanctuary. And then there are also the benefits to conservation uh, that is going to help uh, increase the elephant populations uh, together also with the existing ones. And then there's the direct benefit to communities uh, I'd mentioned earlier on, there's going to be the issue of uh, job um, employment to communities. Uh, and then there's also going to be sharing of uh, revenues uh, through tourism. And then there's the impact on biodiversity. And the other one is the conservation, education, and creation of awareness. So those are the positive ones. And then 6.3 onwards identifies the negative potential. These are the disease risk. There's a sesafly mentioned there. And then of course, there is a summary of uh, diseases that are there and not just transmission of uh, diseases uh, between the elephants that are being translocated, but then also between the elephants that, are, that will have arrived also with the wild elephants. And that's why there is also the issue of uh, anthrax, uh, tripo, the, the sesafly, uh, triposonomiasis is uh, ranked very high. The rest of them are low, sorry. And then also the The, the bisiosis is also high, and then the anaplasmosis uh, are also high. So those ones are there. And then mitigation of the diseases is through surveillance and rapid response. So I'm just running this and skimming this through, uh, through so that at least for those who have not had time, we can have a look at it. Uh, Cecephala eradication program, all right, will be put in place and then control the physiological stress, the stress uh, from the travel, and then also once they settle it. And all these are there. Then also the human wildlife conflict component also is mentioned in the report. And this is where they are saying, at the moment, the sanctuary is surrounded by 150 kilometer fence provided for connectivity between Chimba, Giloni, Maluganje Community uh, Wildlife Forest. Uh, so we, will, we might actually see a lot of fences coming up, particularly in the areas where there is no movement. Then there is also what you call the human elephant uh, conflict mitigation. Then there is the potential threat of poaching.
and then security and enhancement to mitigate poaching. Then there is also the potential of wildfires. There have been uh, wildfires in the area before. And some of these wildfires are intentionally started. Uh, some of them also attributed to climate change issues. <clears throat> and then the impact to biodiversity is also mentioned there, uh, particularly when you are clearing off some areas. And then there is a table that actually summarizes everything. So you can actually uh, get to see a lot of these things when you spend some time uh, going through the report uh, and see exactly what is proposed in the report. Good, so we now want to hear your feedback. Uh, for those who've gone through the report, if there are any things that uh, you think you would like us to capture as we prepare the comments uh, to NEMA. So I open the floor again. I can see two hands are raised up. I want to give the opportunity to, to Keith and Marion. Hello, uh, Steve. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you for an excellent summary of the of the report. Uh, I have had a chance to look through it briefly, um, so I picked up a few points. I first of all, I'd like to say I think, in in general, this principle of elephants uh, discouraging elephants to go into zoos in the first place, but then the idea that this could this uh, could serve as a, as a, well, it, it, it does serve as, as a kind of a test case and, a, and an experiment on the, 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 the viability of moving elephants in the other direction. Uh, so I think that for this reason, uh, it's, it's an important uh, thing to try, I think, or to support, I think. I, I'm, I'm greatly in favor of, of that aspect of the, the, the project. So that's a very big on the, in the, in the positive Im, uh, impact uh, column. Uh, also, uh, the, if there is, uh, if it is possible to, to translate the presence of the elephants into increased tourism, whether it's uh, national locally based tourism or, or an adjunct to international tourism with people, Based at the coast, uh, the, and the benefits do flow to the communities. I think though that is also a very positive aspect of this project, um, this proposed uh, uh, move. Um, however, <laughs> I have a few questions ar arising on the on the con side. Um, <clears throat> so, if if you allow me, and I don't want to dominate, but I, I just try to go through them very briefly. Uh, the, <clears throat> You mentioned the, this question of disease risk and control of tsetse fly. Um, now, I, I know that there's a general program. Well, I don't know. I assume in Kenya, there's a general program on tsetse fly uh, uh, reduction in, or eradication for, to help people with livestock, uh, particularly. But this seems like quite a big intervention uh, to undertake to, to, to try to eradicate the tsetse flies from the Shimba Hills kind of ecosystem just to allow the arrival of a relatively small number of elephants. So <clears throat> in other areas, I know in Southern Africa, when the, when in Botswana, for example, the, the, the approach to eradication of tsetse flies was to spray uh, from the air and that would kill all insects or a lot of them. And that would be very damaging ecologically. This, the method may be more selective in Kenya, but I think there is an e ecological impact on the ecosystem of removing the tsetse fly. I, I think there must be predators, birds, etc., that live on tsetse flies. So, I, so in, in fact, the eradication of tsetse flies itself needs an impact assessment. Um, <clears throat> and it, it is also the potential risk that eradicating tsetse flies from the area could encourage people with livestock to move in. So, so there's that, that's one point about the tsetse flies. Uh, <clears throat> it's one of these things where there's a problem 
disease risk solution, getting rid of the flies, but that creates a new thing in itself. And the second thing relating to that is there's a suggestion that lions could produce a, a, provide a predation risk to, to the elephants. Um, and while there currently are, are few, if, if, if any uh, lions in the, the area, the, it, the possibility of, of them moving in is suggested. And then the idea was that they would also be eradicated. <laughs> well, I, as, as a conservationist, I, I would prefer not to be in favor of killing lions uh, to, to help elephants. So I would hope that uh, a more creative solution to the issue of lions is found. Protecting, obviously, lions pose a risk to people too, but you know, we are aware that, that, that there's work, a lot of work going on in Kenya to promote coexistence between, between lions and people that is not involved killing them. So I would hope that this is not a, a you know, or a, a, a better solution to this issue of lions uh, is, is, is provided rather than just, just killing them. Um, we mentioned this question of fencing already. Uh, and I think you adequately address it, but there's it, in, in this discussion, it talks about caring capacity, uh, you know, being exceeded. And, and I find this a, down, a dangerous um, concept. It, everyone kind of understands what it means, that it, it means, you know, the, the number of elephants, uh, the impact on the vegetation, this sort of thing, but it, only in general terms, when anyone has ever tried to define caring capacity, they've they fail to find the correct number of elephants. So um, I think one of the great values of most of the Kenyan protected areas with elephants is that they are open systems. And Joyce mentioned the, the corridor in Amboseli. There's really a lot of effort going on in Amboseli to prevent it from being encircled by, by, by fences. <clears throat> so I would just reiterate that point again. I think it's already well made. Um, I, I, I won't go into any more depth. There's a question about the genetic contribution of the, of the new elephants to the population. And I think that's a bit risky because these elephants come from, apparently from different sources in Zimbabwe and possibly South Africa, maybe further afield. And this, this is a really big change. Uh, it's not just genetic mixing within the local population, which is already adapted to life in Kenya. So uh, I'm not sure that that's actually a positive benefit uh, that one wants to, to go too far. Uh, moving elephants around the continent, yes, it, it, it's, it's preferable to moving them uh, away from the area, but it, 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 is, a, it is a funny question. And, and, and it, that relates to the idea of the elephants in Shimba being enclosed and separated. The, the better way to allow mixing Genetic mixing is to have corridors. So we, we come back to that again. And then I guess finally, I just close to say that <clears throat> one of the supposed benefits listed was that it demonstrates the, the uh, effectiveness and the possibility of ex situ elephants contributing to conservation. And, and Steve mentioned bongos and, and a couple of other spe uh, species where uh, endangered species have been returned to the wild um, and have contributed to conservation. Uh, elephants are, African elephants are far from this situation. There are uh, orders of magnitude more elephants still in Africa uh, than there are in any captive situations. And the prospect of, of any kind of movement or any kind of keeping of elephants in, in zoos and then released to the wild as, as a contribution to conservation is for elephants is, is non-existent. So I think that point um, shouldn't be part of the argument at all, in my opinion. And I will conclude. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Keith, uh, particularly on the issue of uh, genetic contribution uh, to the population. I think that's a discussion that we'd like to hear from the elephant experts. Uh, on what the thinking is and uh, uh, based on the issues that uh, Keith has raised. Uh, uh, Mar Marion's hand was up, so I want to give Marion an opportunity. 
Thank you. Um, yes, uh, one or two things that I was going to mention, Keith has already said, so I'm not going to elaborate. One was the genetics, which to me is an issue. And also the fact that um, it's it's been sort of used as a big advertisement that the zoos are now contributing to conservation, uh, which will actually only boost zoos in my mind. And I think that is really a no go. Uh, I don't think in any way, as Keith has already elaborated, that, that zoos can contribute to the conservation of African elephants. Um, to me, this whole um, movement now of these howlet elephants to Kenya is a welfare issue, which I welcome. I think it's great that it's been done, but I think you have to be very careful not to sell this as, as being something that, that is going to be positive for conservation, which will only allow zoos to keep elephants more and more, because that is one of their biggest excuses, is to say we can then contribute to conservation. So um, I, I, I um, support what Keith said, that th that should not be part of the argument. Uh, I just have another one or two questions relating to the diseases. Um, I'm just wondering if you, um, I see you've, you have considered the, the trypanosome meiosis, but you, have you considered herpes? I don't know how much of an issue it is, but quite a few elephants and African elephants do uh, um, carry, carry that, the, the virus. So that might be an issue. I also don't know if there are anybody in, in um, the UK is now looking at that. Um, TB is another thing that could be a worry. Now I know that in zoos, they test for TB by doing a trunk wash, which requires the elephants to be fully trained. Now, as far as I'm aware, these elephants at Howlett's are not trained and they are currently being trained to go into containers so that they can be flown. But I doubt that they are going to be uh, totally trained uh, to the degree that you can touch them and that you can take a trunk wash. So those are two things that I'm, I'm a bit concerned about. And also, how will you deal with the ticks, which obviously is a high risk, which the zoo elephants have absolutely no immunity against. You do have a rapid response uh, program for disease outbreak, but are you doing anything to prevent it or to um, see that you can intervene before it's actually an outbreak and might eradicate your entire population? Um, my other questions are uh, related more to the training, and maybe we'll come to that later. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Uh, I missed out. You said that the zoo elephants have no immunity on ticks. These are zoo elephants. They will, they will not be, have immunity towards these African ticks. I mean, some of these elephants are third generation from in the zoo. So um, that could be, I'm not saying it is an issue, but I just feel it should maybe be considered because it might be an issue. Okay, okay. Thank you. I get you now. I get you now. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, elaborator. Uh, I think uh, what I will request you to do is just, uh, uh, you know, send me uh, those uh, diseases that you have mentioned, uh, because we are not uh, quite familiar with the uh, diseases that uh, animals in the zoos uh, do go through so that we can see whether they have been addressed. And that also goes along with the issue that Kate also mentioned about the eradication, the eradication of sesefly. Uh, and how they actually plan to do it. Thank you so much for that. I can see Joyce hey, is... Sorry, yes. can, I, can I just ask you to please send me your email and I can send you some information. I've got various papers on, on the herpes virus and TB, um, which might be an issue. It need not be, but just if you could kindly somehow send me an, your email address that I can provide that information for you. Thank you. Excellent. 
Sheila will say, Sheila will share the email address with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to give uh, Joyce an opportunity then, Athena. Yeah, just um, I I have not read the report yet. So, but I was uh, alarmed to uh, hear what Keith said about lions and you know uh, the concern about elephants being killed by lions or the tsetse flies. And I think it's important that we recognize this is an experiment. If if these elephants can't survive in the wild. Um, they can't survive in the wild, you know, the rewilding doesn't, doesn't work or we learn from our mistakes, but to, uh, to interfere in a natural system to the point where we're killing an endangered species to bring a zoo elephant to, to the wild, it, I think that's totally unacceptable. Um, and to spray or do, you know, damage the ecosystem in any way. Um, through this process is, is just not worth it. So I think we have to accept that some elephants may well die. Uh, that's natural. Uh, same happens in, you know, Amboseli or anywhere else from, from, from disease or accidents. And uh, we have to learn from, learn what we can about this through this experiment. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, when I read the report, that is actually what uh, the report does mention, that it is a first and there is going to be, that's why there's a heavy investment on research uh, to ensure that uh, everything is documented so that we learn lessons and see exactly how uh, these elephants are going to adopt. But I also agree with the uh, uh, Keith and Marion, where we say that we are just hoping that this is not going to encourage zoos to continue keeping elephants and hoping that there, there will be a place for them to translocate them back to uh, the wild. Uh, thank you very much for those Sorry. comments. Uh, Delphina? Can I just add uh, that I totally agree with that. This should not be give the zoos any reason to say that they are going to be like the, the last chance for elephants. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think we're all in agreement for that. <laughs> Can I just barge in here because I would just like to say something about the lions and 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 sorry, uh, if I may, I, I seem to have written the report that there are no lions that chimba, but uh, of course, uh, that doesn't mean that they might not come in. But um, I think the training aspect is, is going to be crucial to, to all of this because the elephants will have to be trained also to stay away from the people, uh, to stay away from the communities. They are now used to having people around them. And that is something that can be done. We have done that in South Africa. It can be done. And they can also be trained to learn what are threats to them, such as lion or, or buffalo or whatever. Uh, but that is part of the training process, which is absolutely crucial. And um, I know that a uh, very successful reintroduction from two circus elephants was done uh, about 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, Randall Moore uh, reintroduced circus elephants from America here in South Africa into Polanisburg Game Reserve. And he spent months training the elephants about what to eat, about dangers, and, and before actually leaving them on their own. And that is something that's going to be highly important. We here in South Africa have reintegrated many ex-trained elephants, not from other countries within South Africa. So the habitat is, uh, issues don't, don't um, you know, come up are, are, are not an issue like with this translocation from the UK. But the success of the operation will rely on how the elephants are trained to learn to stay away from danger and to learn what danger is. Sorry about budging in, but I just wanted to uh, add that on about the lions. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Delfina, your hand was up. Yes, uh, just a quick one on biodiversity impact. 
do we know maybe if they have done some baseline biodiversity studies or maybe are there any rare or endangered plants that are at risk especially when we consider maybe what would be the impact when it comes to the artificial browse of tech from the natural environment thank you okay uh, thank you uh dr ian ritmon thank you i've been listening to the um the comments with great interest um I, I guess I wanted to reassure those who are thinking that, that zoos might see this as a, a reason to, to keep elephants. Um, the Aspinall Foundation is led by Damien Aspinall, um, son of the late John Aspinall, and he is on record at, at wanting to put animals back into the wild and not to keep them in captivity as a, as a um, backup to field conservation, he, he is a, an anti-zoo zoo owner, <laughs> so he's not typical of the zoo community. Uh, I'm curious that, that, that the, uh, I'd like to know what the criteria they had in mind when they selected this site to put these elephants into, because uh, used with the IUCN reintroduction guidelines um, require you to find a site that is in the former range of a species, but where that species has been extirpated, or at least is down to a, uh, such, a, such a low level that it can't survive, and they are reinforcing that otherwise doomed population. That doesn't seem to be the case here, um, which does raise all those issues that have been discussed about disease transmission uh, either way. Um, but these elephants, uh, if they have grown up in captivity, with a lot of veterinary interventions, will have a, a relatively weak immune system. It hasn't been challenged by all the pathogens and organisms that it would have uh, developed to cope with had they grown up in this area. Um, and in terms of anticipated losses, uh, the Aspinall Foundation has been putting captive-born gorillas into the international habitat in Gabon. Um, and there have been some losses from disease, and they're used to the, the consequences of that, the, the public criticism of putting apparently healthy zoo animals into, into the wild where they meet pathogens that they have no immunity to and, and die. So I think that they will be ready for that consequence. But I do agree that this is a very positive sign that a zoo has concluded actually keeping these animals in captivity is not um, not just cannot be justified um, just for human entertainment so they deserve to go back into the wild uh, and I saw that climate change was mentioned as a, a, a topic um, the study by Judith Sitters uh, at the uh, Impala Ranch in Kenya with 20-year exclusion plots uh, showed that soil carbon um, was much higher where elephants had access to vegetation. Um, so there could well be Some a... Some music hits to me. Yes, yes, like the one that we need PVC. As for the raw materials, you're in for a treat. Different substances. Sure from Melanie's intervention is deliberate or accidental. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, so, so if, or color, one if, can choose to create objects that. Sorry, Ian, let me just. Uh, I think there is some interruption somewhere. Could you unmute yourself? There's somebody who's joining. Shell, are you able to unmute the person? Uh, it, Melanie was temporarily unmuted, but there's now muted okay. again. So, um, All right. No, I was just saying that that if if this if they're going into an elephant depleted or or an area where elephants have, have been lost, then the, their presence will restore the elephant component of the ecosystem, and that could be of benefit to biodiversity, uh, not just because you're adding an elephant, but because of the impact they have on the habitat, and and that is now being recognised in more and more places to be very positive on the climate change, because not only are elephant seed dispersal agents um, planting the trees of tomorrow, but they're also um, increasing the, the level of soil carbon 
So it does, um, that there is a potential climate benefit to putting elephants back into an ecosystem which has lost them. Uh, and I can, I can send the, um, the paper uh, from the study in uh, uh, Impala Ranch in Kenya uh, that, that showed how the restoration of, of megafauna, elephants and giraffe, to an area which has previously just had cattle greatly improved the sequestration of sto and storage of, of carbon in the soil. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Yeah, and, uh, uh, not to mention that this particular plastic does not decompose. Uh, thank you, Ian. And we certainly look forward to read that report because there's a whole chapter on uh, climate change. And when you look at the study report, uh, it is not uh, detailed. It's probably a very, very small section. And it also talks about uh, carbon trading. And I don't know how the Shimba Hills ecosystem or the entire ecosystem with now the introduction of elephants actually qualifies for also uh, carbon trading uh, schemes. Those are some of the questions that uh, I had. Uh, good. Uh, I think uh, the feedback that we are getting is actually helping us be able to interrogate the study report and be able to uh, give our comments. And uh, Sheila is going to share the email contact with you uh, so that you can share those reports so that you can see whether they have been uh, carefully studied and included in that discussion. Um, yes, Joyce, I can see your hand is up again. Uh, give you the mic. Yeah, um, no, I'm just, uh, I just skimmed through the report very, very quickly to look to see whether there was any um, detailed monitoring of change in behavior of the elephants. And I think that would be critical, you know, it would be a very good master's or PhD study where the elephants are, are and how, how their behavior and their social relationships, uh, their movement patterns change over time. And, and, and I think it should be a long-term study, um, you know, on the order of perhaps five years or something, just to see how and whether they, they integrate uh, with the, the Shimba population as a whole. So not just a, like um, a translocation study and a release study, but really a long-term long study. Thank you so much. And I think uh, your comment on that, uh, we might also have to look at it and see what opportunities this provides uh, and say, yeah, there is opportunity for more research, particularly in this uh, project. Uh, so thank you for that additional comment. Good. I have not had other participants uh, speak, but I can see quite a good number of them. I don't want to call you by them. <laughs> We are now at 11.17 and, uh, and uh, we want at least to get as much of your input onto this report. And again, I know it is the first time uh, that uh, animal, uh, particularly elephants, that elephants are moving from uh, a zoo to a natural habitat and uh, a wild habitat. It, it may look like uh, there has to be a lot of interrogation once the animals arrive particularly on the training. And I probably just want to have some clarity or, or some understanding. How long does this training take? And I, I was actually thinking as Marion and all the other speakers were talking about the kind of training, how do you train elephant, elephants to keep away from people uh, when we are hearing reports that uh, some elephants, some animals that are used to interactions with human beings will always keep on coming closer to human beings. And I don't know up to whether there is any paper that has actually documented uh, whether some of the problem animals in Kenya are actually those ones that have actually had a close interaction uh, with people. So that then as the training of the elephants are taking, then we also need another level of training to the humans, particularly the communities around this sanctuary, uh, so that they also know exactly how to behave. And that's why I concur with uh, Dr. Joyce that this presents an opportunity for more research, not only on the elephant, but then also more research on the vegetation 
just like uh, Delphine has asked the question um, uh, about uh, changes, about changes on the on the vegetation. And then the other one is uh, there was a question asked about whether there was anything done on the site selection. And to be very honest, I looked at the report and uh, I don't think we had any uh, sites that were considered uh, because when you are talking about uh, translocation of a HUD, uh, you probably want to, to consider others, but the report actually doesn't detail how they arrived at uh, Mwanduganji. Uh, but from what I can deduce from the information about Mwanduganji is that Mwanduganji was set aside as an elephant sanctuary, uh, but then for one reason or the other, uh, the sanctuary seems not to have done very well. And so it probably presents an opportunity uh, where then we can take, uh, where then uh, through this initiative that Maluganja then can be a, a key critical area that can actually be used to, uh, to bring back the populations that are reduced in the area. So thank you so much for those comments. I can see Pat's hand is up and then Marion after Pat. Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I'm one of those who has been silent, but listening carefully to, to, to everyone, because I think here you gathered a lot of extremely valuable uh, information, and it would really be very good if you are able to, to share, in fact, this um, Zoom with um, NEMA, for them to, to listen because there can be things lost in translation. And the expertise of those who have spoken is unquestionable. Um, I think that if indeed they are to, able to listen to this, it will be valuable in terms of going forward, what will happen. The, I suppose it's essential also to highlight how tremendously important uh, the monitoring um, that has been proposed uh, is and that it's something that indeed has been factored there's reference to it but it's not very coming out so very clear and it would be good to know what the uh, the plan for that is um, especially because there is so much capacity advice can be given I think what this makes this particular initiative unique is the fact that, it, to my knowledge, it's the first time that public opinion has been sought in any initiative around um, movie, uh, uh, wildlife. And I think this is a tremendously positive step forward. And the importance perhaps of ensuring that the public is kept appraised of what's happening as well because it's not only Kenyan eyes, I think that will be on this. It is a global, you know, the world, around the world, people will be watching this very carefully to say, this is good or no, it is not good. They should just have remained in, uh, in, in, in the zoo. And where the possibility for rewilding is, um, if it is a, if it's a, a possibility and, and what can be learned, I think it's very important. Marian shared some very valuable information that it would be good to, to, to um, get more information from her about the expertise of people who uh, understand how this works. Um, I think it's also important to understand from the vets, especially those who have worked with um, Sheldricks with the release of orphans, um, and the interactions with of those orphans and local communities, because again, they also have been, you know, accustomed all the, uh, to to being um, somehow uh, involved in the wild. Amongst the conservationists we have, we have got a good number of professors. This, I think, is it's you know, if there is a way for CAK to. To, to share this information within the universities where um, there are those students who are learning about these things. I think 
it's time we have talked for a long time about how to engage um, people and to make sure that uh, wildlife conservation does not remain the domain of a very few. And this may represent that opportunity because I think they, you know, of course, people always want to hear good news and that there's going to be success and so on. Um, but they are equally the same who will be highly critical if um, these, these any animals will die. And I think we've heard from Ian in the case of the gorillas that were taken to Gabon that some did die. You know, this is sadly a reality, but they did not all die. So sometimes it's about that messaging. So I think in sharing with, with Nema, you know, what do we think as Kenyans, you know, that this is an opportunity. We are prayerful that it will be successful, but there are a number of things for them to consider. And as I said at the beginning, if it's possible to share with them this Zoom so they can hear from those experts who have spoken at length on this, I think they will find it rewarding because here we are kind of preaching to the converted, whereas there, um, there's a lot that, you know, a lot of uh, capacity that they could get from this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we shall definitely summarize. And uh, I know Sheila has uh, also posted this on uh, Facebook. So I think it will remain on the website of CAK. And we will actually ask them to tune in and listen as much. Uh, the same thing also applies also to the Wildlife Research Institute and uh, those others that have been involved in writing this. But we'll also prepare a detailed report, which we will share with them. Thank you so much, Pat. The floor is still open for more comments. Yes, Marion. I think that's a new hand. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. It's a new hand. I wanted to reply to your question about the time for the uh, reintegration purpose. Now, because these are zoo elephants, uh, it's going to be absolutely crucial how how this is done. That that that's that's going to to be the the, the A and O of of the success. Um, I see there's a mention in the report of a first of a one hectare boma, then a 20 hectare boma, that is perfect. That is exactly what we would be suggesting and a slow uh, integration. But there's a lot of other factors that need to be considered. They need, the elephants need to be weaned off people, so to speak. Um, I'm assuming that initially they will be fed because if they're in a one, in a one hectare boma, they're going to ha have to be supplementary fed. So there'll be people providing food, maybe even going near the boma and around the boma. And uh, I, I don't know how much they touch the elephants, how much they can touch the elephants. But the elephants actually have to be taught to slowly be on their own. Now, this is not a quick process. Um, even for our ex-trained elephants, which are here in South Africa and which have been roaming in the bush, mostly already where the, the bush that they know, uh, it can take two, three years to get them be, to be totally wild, to do their own thing and to stay away from people. They have to be taught to stay away from people. It, it can be done. Um, with these zoo elephants, we can, you can anticipate anything up to five years. It need not take so long. Maybe those matrox are, are very wise and will quickly adapt. But you have to um, uh, at least calculate and, and um, you, you know, take into consideration that it could take utterly wild as you in the end want them. And um, we are very, unfortunately, our chairman, Brett Mitchell, uh, he wanted to be on this call, but for some reason he's not. Uh, something must have come up in, in the last minute because this morning he said he's going to join. He has successfully reintegrated over 17 elephants himself, not from zoos, 
from uh, elephant back safari operations. Um, and we do have guidelines and we, we, we are very willing to assist with whatever we can. Um, you can communicate with us. We can provide you with protocols how to do it. You can, you can phone us, you can WhatsApp us, you can email us. We are very, very happy to assist you in any way. But I'm assuming that the David Childrick Foundation also has a huge uh, amount of experience. So um, we don't want to step on anybody's toes, but if you need any assistance, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marion, uh, for that wealth of uh, uh, knowledge and uh, that you have and for that willingness to engage with you uh, when we need to. Uh, is there anything that you can advise that uh, we need to capture, particularly for the communities on their preparedness? What is it that the community should prepare for? Uh, sorry, did you direct that to me? That yes, yes. Whether, whether there is any, yeah. Um, I must admit, we do not have that type of experience because our setup is very different here. We do not have many communities living around, but we have a colleague here who works, um, who's just done her PhD and has got 18 years of experience of dealing with communities and how to involve them. And uh, I'm knowing her, she, I'm sure she'll be very, very willing to help. So um, I can ask her also to, to communicate with you any questions that you might have and uh, bring her into the, this discussion, no problem at all. Thank you. Good. So for those who are joining in, uh, we are looking at uh, collecting views and comments on the environmental impact study or the translocation of elephants from uh, UK to Kenya. And these are elephants that have been kept in the zoo and whose origin is actually composed of three countries, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and uh, South Africa. And uh, they could probably be up to second and third generation, implying that they are uh, they are used to to zoos. But then now they are coming to they are being introduced to Kenya for the first time, and we are talking about preparedness and what is it that the project proponents uh, need to capture in the environmental impact study report. And so this is the opportunity that we have to study the report very carefully and uh, identify gaps and then see also how we are going to improve on them. Uh, from experience, we write EIAs to tick projects, uh, but normally the environmental implementation management plan uh, is often not well implemented. Uh, and then also one of the things that we've uh, heard from the participants and has been repeated over and over again. Uh, this is an experiment, being a first, uh, and Marion has shared some experiences of elephants being uh, rehabilitated and rewilded in other places, uh, but specifically for elephants coming from zoos, this is probably the first. And we are talking of not one or two elephants, but we are talking of a herd of 13, comprising of uh, calves, uh, all the way to adults. Uh, and we've also been, uh, we've also discussed uh, quite heavily about issues of uh, disease risks. And uh, we've also received links to some papers that will be shared uh, so that we can see how the plan actually intends to mitigate the diseases and uh, how to minimize disease transmission uh, from the elephants from the zoo to the ones in the wild. And then uh, uh, Joyce also mentioned to us that this is actually an opportunity for more research uh, to study uh, the changes in behavior and the social relationship, uh, <clears throat> the social relationships of these particular animals. And so uh, the monitoring and evaluation component of this study report is one that uh, 
we will need a lot of data to be able to make recommendations to strengthen it. So the floor is still open. If there is anybody who wants to comment, or you probably have a question that uh, you just want to ask so that you are also clear in terms of uh, uh, understanding the project, please do feel free to do that. And I want to give the mic to Ian. Over to you, Ian. Uh, thank you. And I'll try and speak uh, louder so that those who couldn't hear before uh, don't have that problem. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, yes, I forgot to mention that to you. <laughs> on, on, the, um, on the training of the people in the area to um, adapt their behavior to the arrival of these elephants, um, I, I do know that Born Free has a project um, teaching elephant behavior uh, in schools and communities in Kenya. And I'm sure that, that uh, Joyce would, would be able to uh, advise on, on that because people in general, if they're not elephant aware, don't know how to behave. And their behavior, if confronted by an elephant, um, will, will uh, influence, the, influence the outcome of that encounter. Um, so being uh, having some, uh, some training beforehand, some teaching beforehand, is, is a, a very good idea. On the other hand, if the fencing proposal is um, completed, then that sort of unexpected encounter will be less likely uh, unless the people are uh, illegally entering the protected area. Um, but I just wanted to flag up, there is a, a, a fairly close example of an elephant reintroduced from a lifetime in captivity. And that is the case of Nina, uh, a female elephant who spent, I think, 20 odd years in captivity in Arusha and who was then successfully released into Mukamazi. Um, and she was very reluctant at first to leave the boma, which was open, but she, she wasn't confident enough. Eventually, she did gain that confidence, went out, interacted with the wild elephants in the area and, and produced a calf and came back. Uh, and, and sort of showed her human adoptive parents her new baby in the same way that the sheldrick elephants do. So I, I think there, there are a lot of examples of individual elephants being released into the wild. This is the first time a, a herd is doing this, but they will gain, I think, support from each other because the, 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 they have that, that, sort of, that social context which these individuals didn't have. So I think in terms of their sort of emotional stability and ability to cope with the stresses of what they're going through, um, they're in a, a stronger position than the cases where just one elephant is um, released back into the wild. Uh, but I, I, I'm really impressed by the, the range of concerns that are being expressed and, and the, the, this is a, a historic um, experiment. And you're absolutely right, the world will be watching this and we're going to learn from it, whichever way it goes. Um, so I, I sort of congratulate Kenya in, in having the, the courage to try it out. Um, and the Aspinall Foundation, likewise, it, it, um, it, it, it bodes, I think, very well. We're, we're increasing, increasingly aware of the importance of animals in ecosystems. Uh, and putting elephants back into an elephant depleted area, uh, to my mind, is, is, is exactly the right thing to do, both for the benefit of the elephants and for the, the, the function of the ecosystem, which will then provide better ecosystem services to the communities around it and, and to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. <clears throat> yes, your hand is up. <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, just a few points. Um, one of the, there's, a, there's a couple of, um, I guess I say plus minus, but uh, uh, one of the one of the um, unique aspects of this of this uh, project, uh, and there are many uh, that have already been mentioned. The fact this is the first of its kind, but it it because it's the first of its kind. Um, the costs are very high. This is one issue. Uh, if, if this is to be a, a, a model for the future, 
the cost of moving elephants from uh, Europe or further afield to Kenya, just the transport costs would be enormous. Uh, millions of dollars we're talking about. Uh, and, and the commitment uh, that's needed for long-term monitoring will also involve huge financial costs and human resource investment. So, uh, and Marion has mentioned uh, their experience in, so in, in South Africa, that it is, it, it, this process can take many years, not just months. So there is a there is a huge cost to to an event like this, and this applies to future events. But the the fact is that <clears throat> there are people uh, and organizations around the world that ha are motivated by such things, or who who are interested and excited by by this prospect. There's a whole. Uh, community of people who post on Facebook and social media and everything, whenever there's a, uh, a heartwarming story. And uh, to date, that, that's, that, those sources of funds have not really been tapped and, and, and uh, applied to conservation in the wild. It is, fundraising is always a constant challenge for, for um, uh, conservation efforts. So this represents an opportunity, although there's a, a a problem of the, the, the enormous cost. There's also a big opportunity that that this could open uh, the pockets of uh, individuals and organizations that have not previously been involved in conservation work of this kind. And so, although this is actually not really a conservation project, it's more of a welfare project. It does have, as we've discussed, implications for conservation in many areas. And <clears throat> so. This is this is one of the very positive aspects. Is this this potential to uh, open the doors for for a new uh, a whole new uh, area of fundraising, um, and this could be a benefit to Kenya certainly, and Kenya Kenya uh, government and and the NGOs involved could could make use of this money, not just for the elephants. Uh, specifically, but also for the ecosystem and, and, and wider conservation concerns in Kenya. So I think this point needs to be, be uh, placed into the, the mix, is this, this potential for fund, fundraising. It, it's, I mentioned it as a possibility. I don't know whether any, anyone has done any research into it, any you know, uh, market research or such. I and mean, that would be quite an interesting thing to do, I think, to, to uh, speculate and to, to try to actually gather some information on what the new fundraising, the additional fundraising potential is from, from something of this nature, which crosses the boundaries between welfare concerns and conservation. Um, uh, that leads me to the second point of how important documenting this whole process is. Not just research, um, but new research, but just keeping uh, very careful records of all the, the activities and actions that have been taken, uh, successful and unsuccessful, what has worked and what has not worked all the way along the line and a commitment to transparency so that the, there's a learning that goes on. Uh, I mentioned that the, you and others have mentioned the high profile of, of um, this uh, case and how the world will be watching. And there will be a temptation to not report the bad things that go on <clears throat> uh, for fear of, of bad publicity. Um, I think it's really important to be able to manage that process. You, if something goes wrong, it, it needs to be explained why it's gone wrong uh, and what people have learned. And so the a commitment to, be, to openness, if this is seen as something where uh, where there's a cover up or whether the, where there's uh, bad news is hidden and uh, that will reflect badly on the whole process in the long run. So I think that it's very important that this whole thing is going to be in the glare of publicity, but I think it's very important for there to be a commitment to uh, transparency of the documentation that, that of the good and bad things that happen, the, the successes and, 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 and failures, and then the learning that's, that's gone on. Um, and, and I think it's, 
the final point I just make is that there's mention of uh, elephants, uh, these elephants contributing in a way to depleted areas uh, <clears throat> or to genetics as mentioned before. I think we think that shouldn't be emphasized too much uh, in the benefits of this project. There are many elephants in Africa already. Some are in places where they may not be wanted. Uh, others, their populations are growing. There's no need to bring elephants from Europe to restore populations or to create ecosystem services or to uh, support genetic diversity. There is plenty of scope for that within Africa. So, uh, and indeed the, the, the decision taken at the CITES, last CITES COP was, was that <clears throat> movements of elephants from some countries in Southern Africa should be to other parts of, of the natural range. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to emphasize, I think, the point of bringing uh, that these elephants coming in from outside are going to pre be producing wonderful uh, results for the ecosystem. Uh, there's, that can be and should be done by elephants within Africa. Um, so I think that that point can be perhaps downplayed uh, in, in public statements and in analysis of this, uh, this uh, report. That's it for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Those are very, very uh, important uh, comments that you have uh, uh, mentioned, uh, which we are actually going to work on them. Uh, we're actually going to include them in the report. <clears throat> uh, good. I think we have uh, discussed uh, quite at length a few of uh, those issues, uh, particularly the rationale of uh, moving elephants and improving the genetic pool uh, or from, from zoo animals to the wild. We've also discussed about issues of training of elephants and the adjustment We've also discussed about to expect some mortalities, that mortalities will be there and we'll use the mortalities that will take place as a, a learning curve. We've also spoken at length about diseases uh, and we've also spoken at length about uh, Lisa, uh, Kate, Kate has actually brought in the concept of the issue of uh, the cost of translocation itself. And as we are talking about the cost of translocation, I was actually looking at the cost of actually uh, taking them through the training and adapting. They will not be used to eat the food uh, because this is something that they are not used to. Uh, and I think they are cost at every uh, element, even as we look at it in terms of the tourism potential uh, that these elephants are about to attract. Uh, but there's quite a bit. And uh, I like what, uh, uh, I like what uh, Ian uh, mentioned that uh, Kenya is taking a, a good risk, <laughs> a good risk at this particular time, uh, but we'll see uh, whether it will bear uh, fruits at the end of the day. Uh, I think um, there are no hands that are ready to comment uh, or there are no hands that are ready to ask a question. Uh, the information that we've received is uh, quite substantial, substantive at the moment, and I think we are going to retreat uh, and receive the information that we've received and see how we're going to submit the comments. Uh, we would request you to share with us your email address so that we'll continue sharing the final report that we'll submit with you. So for those who have joined, just uh, share on the chat your email address. Uh, so that uh, for purposes of future uh, updates on, uh, on, uh, on, on what we needed, some of you we may need to reach out to you uh, for more help. Uh, we would appreciate that. I can see Marion's hand again is up. So Marion, the mic is yours. Just a very last quick question. Um, I saw on the plan, on the loading plan, that they intend separating mother and calves in adjacent, in adjacent containers, but separate. And I'm a bit concerned about that. We usually move mother and very young calves together. Uh, that could be an issue, but I don't know how much influence you have on that. But it's just something that I was a little bit concerned about. Any rationale why that should not happen? I think that would be very important for us to put a note on that. 
and also um, and also whether you have designs where you put the mother and the calf together uh, as far as i'm aware yes uh, that that here when we do translocations of of any kind it, we always put mother and very young calf i see uh, you've got four calves now uh, under the years of, of four, one is even two years old. I think that could cause immense stress, but maybe that is something that one would need to discuss with the vets. Maybe they're scared that the mother might crush the, the, the calf, but um, the stress factor must be considered. In, and uh, our experience is that when you move the mother and the calf together in one container, the mother is much, much calmer. But I don't want to interfere here with the vets who might, might have more experience, but it's just something that maybe you could question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. At least that gives me uh, adequate uh, information in order to request for that. <clears throat> the good thing about these public participation processes is it gives us an opportunity to interrogate and an opportunity also to engage and also challenge what is in the study report. And quite often, because it's a fast, you may actually find that uh, the team that was actually putting this together may not have been aware uh, of that particular issue. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think I've taken that into consideration. Good. If uh, there are no other comments and feedback coming, uh, because we had intended to have this session run all the way up to one o'clock, uh, but also in view of uh, uh, people's time and schedules, which we highly appreciate. Uh, I think we would like to uh, bring this particular conversation to a close over the next five minutes uh, so that then now we can uh, take up directions in terms of way forward. Uh, we have recorded the session. The session was also um, uh, live fed on uh, Facebook. And so if you want to listen to it, you can go to Facebook and also be able to see it and listen. Uh, if there are any issues of concern uh, that uh, probably you think of them later on, uh, you can actually send uh, feedback to info at Conservation Alliance of Kenya. We will put up a, a report which we will submit as required uh, through the participation process. And then we will also share that report with you uh, for purposes of just ensuring that uh, uh, we are communicating with uh, clarity. Jo uh, Dr. Joyce, I can see your hand is up. I give you the mic. Uh, sorry, Steve, I know you're trying to wrap up, but just a quick uh, comment. This is uh, coming up fairly soon. If, if a student uh, could be found, I, I would really recommend uh, talking to Cynthia seeing if you can't uh, begin some sort of, you know, monitoring protocol, sit down and discuss with the Amboseli Trust uh, and see if that person couldn't start going out with Nora and Katito um, and, and getting some basic monitoring understanding of, of elephants. And then, you know, uh, others of us could, could feed in on, on what other aspects of monitoring should be undertaken, whether it's, uh, you know, acquisition of, of plant species and uh, behaviors and so on and so forth. But I think this is something that needs to be, you know, looked at before the elephants are there so that the person is ready to go as soon as they arrive. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, one, of the, one of the other discussions that, uh, we might actually recommend is that we delay the process, the process rather than rushing it. I think preparation is very, very important. And because this matter just came up recently, I don't think it would be prudent, particularly now that we are getting into an election uh, season for Kenya, uh, that it would be prudent to wait for the next government uh, coming so that then uh, on issues to do with uh, funding and raising resources that at least it's something that the new government also is aware and, it, and, 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 and can actually undertake a commitment to support a project of such a, a magnitude. And that also gives us time also to, to, to work with various teams uh, and access information, particularly on elephant behavior uh, that would just not only help the community, but also the implementers of the of the project. 
Yes, Marion, uh, your hand is up also. I just wanted to, uh, yes, uh, to confirm what, what Joyce said. I think it's highly important and, and I support that you, you do a study from day one on these elephants. I would even suggest, if at all possible, that the student or, or, or the researcher um, looks at the elephants and monitors the elephants and takes notes already while they are in the UK, gets to know, know the individuals, and then to see the difference from the before and after of the behavior that could be very important, if, if it's at all possible. Thank you very much. We will do this together with the Wildlife Research Training Institute uh, so that they grant them the permission actually to do it. And I think it's very important that we get uh, those students that are interested in an opportunity to get the necessary access and permission uh, to be able to conduct this research training with the Wildlife Research Institute. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, uh, this particular discussion has been very helpful. Uh, the fact that I know a lot of you also have been consulted under the African Elephant Specialist Group and you've already given your views there. I'm fully aware about it. Uh, but I also appreciate you taking time uh, to be able to share your knowledge and your experience on the ground on what has worked. And uh, hopefully uh, we should uh, be able to, uh, to, 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 to lobby our government actually not to rush the process, but give it every due diligence and ensure that uh, they have taken every precautions and that whatever they are put in as mitigation measures are things that are practical and things that can easily be implemented. So thank you so much for your time and uh, wish you all the best of luck, but we'll be in touch. Thank you for sharing also your contacts. Uh, we will keep you updated on every step. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Very good. Okay. All right. Bye now. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you.